So as we continue in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. And we started this last week. And we'll see how far we can get through chapter 7 this week. But we'll start in verse 1, the reading of God's word. Let us pray first. Father God, we thank you for this time together in your word. We pray that you would bless the, the reading of your word, the hearing of your word, the preaching of your word, that we would all be able to, to give ear to it. That we know as the Puritans would say, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. So we'd pray there would be a lot of, of ice melting today, that you would help us to, to hear your word be comforted and strengthened and made more like Christ by what we hear today. And if there are those who hear who do not know you, that even through the hearing and preaching of your word, that there would be faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation chapter 7, which takes up from chapter 6, um, verse 15, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide from us, from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So we're at the, the final judgment, the, the end of the world as people would, would see it. But what we're going to see is there's going to be a, a delay that some things are going to happen before the end of the world as all these things begin to unravel in increasingly um, greater numbers. We're going to see there's a protection that's given to the people of God. And so we come to chapter 7 and we read that after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now, keep in mind, after this doesn't mean after the day of the, of the Lamb's wrath, but after I saw this vision, then I saw something else. And so what you're seeing is this is all being displayed. It's going to happen, but it's like, just a second, we're going to do something else before this occurs as well. So I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And so last week we looked at this, and this number 12,000 is symbolic of wholeness. It's 12 squared times 1,000, which is the totality of the, the church, all the believers, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But it's anchoring us in the, the, uh, the faith of the saints who have gone before with the understanding that the Bible teaches that people in the Old Testament were saved by this, in the same way that people in the New Testament are saved, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. The people in the Old Testament were given uh, a certain amount of light, and they were told to obey God. They're told to trust God. And in all of these images and all of these ceremonies and all of the sacrifices and all the things the prophets and, um, and Moses and um, other writers talked about, 
you were to follow, you were to believe, you were to trust in God, and we would see that there is a promised one that is increasingly uh, revealed through the Old Testament until we get to the new covenant finally being revealed and we see Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross so that in its fullness and completeness now the plan of God has been accomplished in Jesus Christ. As Jesus on the cross says, Ted Telestai, it has now been finished, accomplished once and forever. And so now what we do is we rest in that work. We look back to the finished work of Christ. The same faith that was in God in the Old Testament is the same faith which is in God in the New Testament, which you all and always find its yes and amen and only in Jesus Christ. And so this is where we find ourselves now. So there is a complete number of those who will be sealed by the Holy Spirit. And what you see is that John says in verse 7, I heard the number. So he's hearing this. He's hearing this. And in verse 9, after he hears this, I looked and then I saw what he's talking about. And what he sees instead of 144,000 Jewish people standing around going, this is great. What he sees is a great multitude that no one can number. So there's our interpretation of the 144,000. It's not literally 144,000 it's a, guess what it's in a book of symbols and it's a symbolic number and it represents a great multitude that no one can number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb so if you recall at the end of verse 6 chapter 6 and verse 17 for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And the answer is, you guys. These people. Those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Those who know Christ. That's who can stand. No one else will be able to stand. So last week, we talked about people who are afraid to study Revelation. One, they don't want to get into it because it's all symbols, and symbols can be interpreted in any direction. It's like, as with the rest of Scripture, which can be twisted, you use scripture to interpret scripture. So we're going to use the Bible and let the Bible interpret it for itself. And that's not going to be as difficult as we may think. But it's also people afraid of, I don't even want to hear about the end times because I'm afraid of what we may go through. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to deal with it. And it's a shame for the church because God tells us things and wants us to be prepared for things that are coming. So we think, well, I've read, heard terrible things about how bad the Great Tribulation is going to be, and I don't want to be in that. I mean, and who does want to be in that? But we're in the Great Tribulation. Some people today are going through greater tribulation than others. We're all going through some level of tribulation, but there probably will be worldwide, as we have seen repeatedly over and over again, greater and greater uh, rises of the beast, where Nero again recurs. He, he comes back again and again, not the actual person, but the spirit of that, the spirit of Antichrist. And then the church rises up and is protected through these times. And who knows where we are now? Who knows how close we are to the end? Things are getting pretty bad, which is great for the church because we shine brighter during these times. But things have been bad before, and as the church grows and shines, um, Satan may be again, once again, cast down, pushed aside, and who knows what you know? These, the church in China may produce for the rest of us as we see another great awakening or another outpouring of the spirit where the, the new Puritan writers come from these third world countries or, or um, all these other places in the world where God has been at work, constantly at work, even though the beast, the governments of the world are doing all they can to put that down. Um, just even from my personal experience in Haiti, seeing what the gospel is doing there as it is the attempt of Satan to completely shut that down, it only grows the brighter. So we pray that that continues to happen as we stand as the only ones who can in the time of the wrath of the Lamb. And that is what is to be feared, as we'll see. Not the wrath of man, but the wrath of the Lamb from whose wrath we are protected. And he sees them standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, 
with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. So what we see happening in verses 9 through 12 is as John sees this multitude that's been sealed, that's been saved, as you see worship happening in heaven. You see the response to salvation to be worship. And it's wonderful that we see that all the nations are going to be there. And since we see it begun with the listing of these children of Abraham, um, the tribes of Israel, we were remembering and called to remember the promises made to Abraham. That Abraham, in you, all the nations will be blessed. Your numbers will be as the stars in the heaven, as the, as the sands of the seas. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. And then Jesus says, I will build my church. As what we see with this listing of the 12,000 from each tribe is a type of military census. And that's what's supposed to remind you. From this tribe, there are this many. From this tribe, there's that many. So we have this military census that comes in mind. And so we hear Jesus saying, I will build my church. We see him later in Revelation on this white horse where an innumerable number of the saints are behind him that are, that are coming up as the gospel goes forth. And he says that I will build my church and the gates of a hell shall not prevail against it. And the church is equipped with the word of God and the Holy Spirit to do battle against every argument and every lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10. And he says, the, and Paul continues to write and says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And that's what you need. You don't go into a spiritual battle with a knife. Because you've seen movies. You can't kill spiritual things or physical things. You've got to have some special weapons designed for these special enemies. And you have to have special armor designed for these special enemies. And we have the spiritual armor that God gives us, which we see in Isaiah and we see in Ephesians. And the weapons of our warfare are powerful for bringing down strongholds. And what we're seeing today are strongholds. Strongholds which are strengthening. Strongholds which are gaining hold on people. So what do we do? It's the gospel. It's the word of God. It's being able to recognize the difference between the truth and the lie because we have the Holy Spirit and we have the word of God. And it's being able to proclaim to the world, maybe we get killed in the midst of it, but the, those who were the martyrs in past times um, were so successful in the growth of the church that a, a phrase arose saying that the blood of the church, the blood, the, is the, the, what is it? the blood of the church is the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the witnesses, the blood of those who died because of their faithful witness to the world and governments, to the, the truth of Jesus Christ, were put to death by the sword, and their blood becomes a seed of the church as others watch and go, unbelievable, unbelievable. And then they believe. Are we willing to have that happen to us? Or have we bought into the health and wealth prosperity gospel so much that we believe we won't go through tribulation? We can't possibly be put to death. I'll say whatever I have to say. I mean, 
Think about the times that we capitulate to the culture because we don't want to speak the truth of Jesus Christ because we don't want to get what? And nobody here has been, that I know of has been threatened with death yet. But what if we are? Then do we see the gospel of Jesus Christ as being of no effect, of being of no value. Prepare your children. Prepare yourselves. Not because I'm a prophet and saying this is going to happen. But it can. It has. And it will. When? Stand firm. Stand strong on a rock. And it's the rock of Christ Jesus. So we have to be very careful that we know who we're worshiping. So look at verses 9 through 12. Their worship. Where are they worshiping? Before the throne and before the Lamb. The living God is on the throne. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, right there, seated at God's right hand, ruling all things as the Holy Spirit has gone out and washed robes with the blood of Christ, renewed hearts, brought people into his presence. And also we see they're wearing these white robes as purity and holiness. They are clothed. It takes you back to the garden. They were naked and ashamed. They tried to hide themselves with things of their own. Um, fig leaves, God said, this will not do. He slays an animal. He covers them with its skin. It's because the day you eat, you shall die. They did not die because God provided a sacrifice and covered them with skins that pointed to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his ultimate son, who would die and we'd be clothed with his righteousness. And that's our only hope, is to be clothed with faith and washed clean by the blood of Christ, as we'll see in a moment. And third, they have these palm branches. We saw that in Christ's triumphal entry as he's coming as king into Jerusalem. And the people there, uh, the, Phar the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests saying, stop these people from saying this because they're saying, Hosanna, salvation belongs to the Lord. Exactly what they're saying here in verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God. And now they're saying that's you. They're claiming you're to be the king that's to come. They're giving you all this God-like um, worship. And Jesus says to them, if I tell them to be quiet, the very rocks are going to cry out. And so what we see is this worship. And in verse 10, we see what they're saying. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Go to Psalm 115. Because Psalms is not that difficult of a book to find. Psalm 115. And remember, this is the worship that is taking place in heaven. What has inspired their worship. What they're saying in worship. How they feel in their worship. So Psalm 115. Prophetically all looking forward to these things. Martin Luther believed that all the Psalms were coming from the spirit of Christ on the cross. And somehow he is um, inspiring these. This interesting thought. So Psalm 115 verses 1 through 11. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us. Not to us. Not to us. But to thy name be the glory. Not to us. Not to us. The saints are, are before the throne, and they're not looking around at each other and going, man, you did good. High five it. That's right. As if we could see what I believe to be one of the most pitiful aspects of pride and arrogance when a football team goes over and begins to slam and look at me and do all this as they gloat over their wonderful performance. That will not be the way it is in heaven. It will be whoa, <laughs> as some athletes do, they point up. They're trying to say, you know, this is to you, give the glory. But in our salvation, you have nothing to brag on. Nothing. You're not going to go, oh, look at this. You did good, buddy. I mean, you might look at each other and be tempted to worship, but there's going to be a greater person there to worship. So Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Do you believe that? That's worship. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Really? Doesn't seem like he's in so much control. Maybe we need to take the reins ourselves and start manipulating things until he comes back and we can say, we fixed it for you. Here we go. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Then he says, but they are the nations, the peoples, their idols are silver and gold. So that's what we see today. Silver and gold. 
They're idols or the work of human hands. It's that thing which you pay the most attention to. The thing that you pay most attention to because it means the most to you. And it may be the thing that you pay most attention to in order to get the thing that you really want the most of. The thing that you pay most attention to. And what is it? Because these are their idols, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they don't feel. They have feet, but they don't walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat, these idols that they worship. And those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. Do not worship idols. Those who make them and do not trust in them. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both great and small. And he goes on. But this is the worship we see. Not to us. Not to us. But to thy name be the glory. The saints are not worshipped by the angels. The saints are not worshipped at all in heaven. They are worshippers of the one true God. Because salvation belongs to God. Even the heavenly powers are worshipping God for what has happened to us. The heavenly powers are worshiping God because they know this has been more than just what's happening here on earth. This has complete, total, cosmic importance. And the Lamb has come and is setting all things right in heaven and on earth. So it's not just about us. The angel's are like, oh, that's an interesting thing that's going on over here. As we're going about our business, let's go check and see what's happening here. Because it's all about what's happening in heaven. And heaven is at the center and what you see as it comes out is all that is happening out in the world it's like the pebble you drop and it just goes out in waves at the center the thing that starts all things at the middle of all things is god he is the one who is on the throne and when we see our salvation that is when worship takes place in verse 12 they say amen and at the end of this statement they say amen again and that is the statement of worship. When we say amen, we agree wholeheartedly with what has been said. Let it be so. Let it be so. And they say, blessing, eulogia, that is everything that's good can possibly come, comes from God. Glory, as doxa, it's this magnificence, the splendor, this beauty, this dazzling light. Wisdom is Sophia. It's the knowledge beyond, that's not the person Sophia, it's the word Sophia which means wisdom, and it's knowledge beyond information about how things work, the inner knowledge of all things. And then to him is thanksgiving, Eucharistia, which is if there's anything worth being thankful for, it is from God. And honor, which is Tame, which is reverence, esteem, worthy of praise. And then you have these two words, dunamis and nixkus, which is power and might. It kind of means the same thing. And they want to double up this thought. So when we're looking at God, they're just saying blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Because look what he has done so much that all of creation bows before his presence and worships him. And anything less from us is because you just don't get it. And it can be difficult. But in verse 14 again, he said, Sir, tell me who they are. He says, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. All right, so blood should make it red, of course, but this is a vision of what's happening. It's not by their works, but by the works of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, his blood provides our righteousness. Again in the garden, the day you eat, you shall die. Fig leaves, no animal skin. It's going to have to be Jesus Christ. And we cannot cover our sin. 
You stand before God in judgment. If he's judging you, you will stand naked, ashamed, in the white, hot holiness of a perfectly holy, all-knowing, all-just, wrathful God over sin will see through every pretense and every lie, and you yourself will testify against yourself because you'll be forced to say nothing but the truth, and part of the truth will be how much you hate the one that you see standing before you. And so you will be rightly cast into the lake of fire by God himself who sent his son to die for the sins of his people and to neglect such a great salvation is a terrible sin in itself. And this is how God loved the world. He sent his only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal and everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 the great exchange. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. It's Jesus. He made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. He takes our sin, gives us his righteousness. He's resurrected and he's, he's risen and we're risen with him and we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. He was not a sinner on the cross, but he became sin. We are not righteous doers in our own, our own, but we are declared to be considered as right. And we're treated as such because we're hidden in him. He is your white robe of righteousness. That's what we're covered in is Christ. Our robes without Christ are filthy. Isaiah says even your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. So Jesus knew no sin and became sin. Our sin was punished with him on the cross and therefore his blood cleanses our robes. Not to us. Not to us. But to thy name be the glory. Salvation belongs to our God. Amen? <laughs> Man, I mean, do I, I don't have you. I mean, that's the problem. I, I'm not gripping you with this. And it's not my job to do it. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do this. But I pray that you can get into this enough so that, like, you're trying to figure out how do I preach this? What, what, how do you possibly get people to see what's happening here? How do you get people who are half asleep? How do you get people who are kind of listening? How do you get people who are distracted by a great many things in their own life to see what is going to happen in the last time when we're all afraid of what might happen? There's no need to be afraid. You're going to stand before the throne of God who has died on your behalf where you ought to be. I know what our problem is. That we don't understand hell. We don't understand. from. We kind of think we probably ought to have been saved. I mean, look at us. I mean, you know, I'm standing here looking at you. I saw a comedian the other night. He says, you know, this is about the best you can do. It's like, you know, you made choices. You put things back and put other things back on. You know, you're doing fine. You're doing all right. You're doing, you're doing good. <laughs> but we deserve nothing from God. That's not true. We deserve God's wrath. And we don't get it because of what Jesus did. And they're worshiping him. We're going to look what this says because this is what... God wants us to see. All right, you've washed your robes. you made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then therefore, in heaven, you get this. God gives you this heavenly scene. So when he starts to talk about what's going to happen to the world, when you see the wrath of the Lamb, and you see what's getting caught up in the world, that you're going to be in heaven, and this is what you're going to see. You're going to be standing. You're going to be before the throne of God, and you're going to serve him day and night in the temple. Now, that can be bad. Unless you know the one that's there and see how awesome this is. And you're going to be able to serve him. This is going to be wonderful to be before him day and night in the temple. And he is the temple. Later we see there's not really even night there because he is the light and he is the day. So you've got to think in this imagery, you're going to be in the presence of God. And what is he doing? He's sitting on the throne. And he will shelter them with his presence. Literally, he will tabernacle you. He will cover you. He will protect you. His very presence keeps anything from happening in you. And you have a little bit of that going on now where nothing can happen to you that doesn't pass through the filter of his love. And that all things that happen to you are working together for good to his glory. And then it says, they'll hunger no more. Neither thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
So we'll be sheltered by his presence. There's lots of craziness in the world. There is lots of evil. There is chaos, confusion, cruelty, lies. But God is wise and powerful and mighty and good and honorable and holy. And he will spiritually protect you. And he is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. And you, you have to go to Romans 8. So Romans chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And just hear it in the context of this worship. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it cannot submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of Christ dwells in you, so you have to ask yourself, does he? Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So if you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And then verse 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined... These he called, and those whom he called he justified, and those whom he justified he glorified. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It's him who says you're right. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us and all creation is worshiping him there. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors, victors, nikaios, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And therefore, when we are seeing him in his fullness in heaven, we fall on our faces and we worship. Us being surrounded by all the angels as well. If time permitted... We'd look at Isaiah 49, 8 through 10, and Isaiah 25, 6 through 10, where we see these very things that are being quoted here. Um, they shall hunger no more, thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor scorching heat. And Isaiah says he will wipe every tear from their face, from their faces. And here it says from their eyes. This is prophesied long before. Revelation is giving us new stuff. It's just saying, look at this, what's happening to you from the perspective of of the Bible here all at once. And then we see verse 17, the lamb in the midst of the throne 
will be their shepherd. The lamb will be the shepherd. Jesus told the woman at the well. Because he goes on, he says, the, the lamb in the midst of the throne will be the shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. So you have the shepherd, and he will be the guide, and he will guide us to springs of living water. As he said to the woman at the well, if you had asked me to give you a drink, I would have given you living water to drink. Not well water, living water. And he said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give you will never thirst again. And you hear what we're hearing here in Revelation. It will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So even as you live in this life and Jesus gives you the, the, the living water, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his spirit, it's supposed to well up in us and spill up into others so that we have life in him, even in the midst of whatever it is going on around us. That's how the martyrs of old, that's how they're able to stand tied to a post and being set on fire. That's how they're able to stand in Nero's Rome in the Colosseum as the lions are unleashed to eat the the Christians that are standing out there. They're able to stand and worship God and say, Amen, hallelujah, let it be so. For I have a strength, I have a power, I have a God in heaven, and there is living water to which I'm drinking, of which you know nothing about. And so that's what enables us not to just be able to stand just in times like that, but in times when you're about to give up yourself and you're pulling your hair out because I just can't take it anymore. Stop focusing on the flesh. Stop focusing on this world. It has tremendous power to pull you down. Tremendous power to pull you down. But the Holy Spirit says, put your feet on the rock of Christ Jesus. Put on spiritual armor. Take up the sword of faith. Surround yourself with believers. Get in church where you can be encouraged by one another. You can be helped by one another. You can be picked up by one another. You can hear the word of God being applied to your particular circumstance. You can go home and read the Bible on your own as you're being taught. You're learning. You go to Bible studies where women are getting together and talking about things. Men are getting together and talking about things. Men and women are getting together and talking about things of the Lord. Because one day we're going to be worshiping him in fullness. And yes, it'll be great and glorious, but you've got a ways to go yet and to him who conquers, to him who is victorious, to him who maintains their faith through this difficult time, you get all this stuff. And the good news is it only takes a little bit, and you're not saved by your perseverance. You're persevered by Christ in heaven so that when you get to heaven, you don't look around and say, man, you guys made it. You go, salvation be to God alone, to him alone. Not to us, not to us, but to thy name be the glory. Jeremiah 2.13, he says this, My people have committed two evils. One, they've forsaken me. And this is what you know, many people in the church have done. Um, it's the, the people in the world have done this. But then they've done something else. They've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they've got these tanks of water that they've dug so that when the rain comes, it, it holds this water and they've done it for themselves. God is saying, come to me for this life. And we're like, nope, I know where I can get life. I'll use my checkbook. I'll use my bank. I'll use whatever it is. I'll use power. I'll use glory. I'll use prestige. Whatever it is, I will use this and I will fill it up with water and it's broken and it won't hold anything. But that's what you're putting your promises in because you faith, once you abandon God, you have to put your faith in something. And putting your faith in something else also causes you to abandon God because you're going to spend a lot of time. If you've ever had anything that's broken and has a leak, it demands your attention. And he says, you're putting your attention on the wrong things. You've hewed out cisterns for yourselves, broken ones that can't hold no water. It's what a liberal church has done. It's what any church that forsakes the word of God has done. And it's certainly the condition of the world going your own way, not only a lost lamb, but a rebellious lamb who is being led and being led only to death, being led by evil shepherds who promise hope and change, who promise regaining former glories, who promise safety, peace, who promise whatever it is you need. I'm just trying to remember what was Pedro's in Napoleon Dynamite, he had the best campaign slogan. What was it? Somebody's got to remember that. I would make all of your dreams come true. I think that's what it was. <laughs> 
I will make all your dreams come true. Um, vote for me and I'll set you free. Ball of confusion. That's what the world is today. But that's what it is. Vote for me and I'll set you free. Who? You? You're putting us in shackles. I'll go to you because you'll set us free. He will not. If that's who you're going to, or if that's who you're going to be to set free, you're being led by a shepherd that can do nothing for you. It's the shepherd of Jesus Christ is the only one who will send you on the proper way. Because if you are looking for something else, regaining former glories, getting hope from somewhere else, payback to your enemies, or perfect peace and unity, if you trust them, then you're lost. Psalm 23. The shepherd's psalm read it many funerals and remember what we have read is the, sh the lamb will be the shepherd to so psalm 23 thinking of jesus christ being worshiped and what we have heard about him in the book of revelation yahweh the lord is my shepherd the lamb jesus christ is yahweh jesus christ is a guy so I won't, I shall not want. And what does he do? He makes me lie down in green pastures. And this isn't just talking about heaven. This is talking about in the midst of the presence of my enemies. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know the song like a bridge over troubled water. It's like troubled waters. It's like, no, he will lead you beside still waters. He restores your soul. He will lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil because the lamb is with you. And his rod and your staff comfort you. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our heads with oil and our cups overflow. So surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The world is held together by love. Satan seeks to destroy by tyrannical force, and it is not the way of the Lamb. You believe in him, the living water. So the church has no need to fear the tribulation, any tribulation. There's no need to fear it. You face it boldly. You're clothed in white robes in his presence. Don't fear those who can kill the body, Jesus says, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. But as we will see coming in the next chapters, <clears throat> there's going to be a woe to those who dwell on the earth, the non-believers. It's a phrase in Revelation. Those who dwell on the earth, talking of those who do not believe. They're living in open rebellion to God, not following the Lamb. There's a great wrath that's only being held back now by the grace of God. Today is a day of salvation, but the time is short and none of you are guaranteed tomorrow. It's appointed once for a person to die and then there's judgment. Revelation 14, 10 through 11 says this of the non-believer. So I said there's no need to fear Revelation if you're a believer, but if you're not, you will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will, you will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of your torment will go up forever and ever, and you will have no rest day or night. It's horrific. And that's why there's worship around the throne that sounds like this. Revelation 10 through 12. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fall on their faces before the throne saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And in verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God. Listen to the difference. They serve him day and night. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They don't hunger anymore. There's no thirst anymore. The sun doesn't strike them, nor scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So there's only two possibilities. There's only two outcomes of this life. 
You drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and you will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb, and the smoke of your torment will go up forever and ever, and you will have no rest day or night. It's what God's word says. Or you'll be in his presence where he will protect you, he will comfort you, he will strengthen you, he will wipe tears from your eyes, he will lead you to streams of living water. And you have that now. Not in fullness, but in reality, if you call on him to save you, if you trust him with everything, trust him even with your obedience and warn others and shine as a light in the world so they see your good deeds, see how you deal with stuff different than other people do, and glorify your Father in heaven. So let's pray. Father God, uh, throne room scenes, d d d we're, we're so callous to our own salvation. Help us. It's, it's like, I, like I, I find myself wanting to pray for persecution, wanting to pray for <laughs> all these terrible things that happen so that we might see better. I, I don't want to learn that way. I pray that you would help us to, to see there's enough evil and chaos around us every day if we just open our eyes to see it, but, then, but not be despaired by it, but to understand how great a salvation there is and that we should be proclaiming the salvation of the Lamb. So that on the day when all things are set right, when darkness is put away, sin is dealt with as it ought to be, and there's no more grace and mercy. We pray that we could snatch many from the flames, that by our faith we would proclaim not to us, but to the name of God be the glory. Even as we come to your table, we're reminded all that we have comes from you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen.